Welcome to the Quantum Summer Symposium 2021. We use the symposium to update you on our project and also to point out avenues how you can collaborate with us. And true to Quantum, we seem to be on an exponential trajectory. So this is the fourth installment of the Summer Symposium. And I recall the first time we did it, we had well less than 100 invited guests. And this time, last time I checked, we had over 4,000 attendees. Obviously, everything I'm going to present um, is due to a large and rapidly growing um, capable uh, team. And to make a plug here right in the beginning, we are intending to grow rather rapidly. We will double in size over the next um, uh, two years and we will hire well over 100 new employees. And we cherish diversity along many dimensions and we think it makes our team stronger. So in particular, if you think you are excited about our project and you think you can uh, contrib contribute, please check out our um, pages on uh, quantumai.google. Uh, and uh, one misconception I would like to um, dispel is please don't think, oh, I'm not working in superconducting uh, quantum uh, computing, so the Google team is probably not so interested in me. This is not correct. Again, diversity, if you have a background in photonic systems or in iron trap systems, if you have skills in adjacent engineering disciplines, such as microwave engineering, chip layout, um, chip manufacturing techniques, we would like to hear from you. And even if you don't see, you know, in the, on this careers page, there are always like specific job description for skills we are hiring at the moment. But even if you don't see the perfect match, don't worry, just reach out to us and uh, tell us about yourself. And um, yeah, hopefully we get to work together. If you followed our project, um, you may have noticed that we got a nice endorsement from our CEO Sundar Pichai at Google I.O. So he helped us unveiling the new Quantum AI campus in Santa Barbara. And he also affirmed Google's commitment to quantum computing, in particular that Google is ready to invest the many billion dollars it will take to go all the way to an error-corrected quantum computer. Uh, here you see a quick map of the new campus, which now consists of three different laboratory complexes conveniently located around the Santa Barbara airport. And in particular, last year, I only showed you a conceptual drawing, but now you see we moved in. And as you can see, uh, we try, or we often refer to this as a temple to technology. We have an artist in resident program, so it's not only state of the art technologies that in, in these labs, but we try to make them very pleasant working environments uh, conducive to creative work. And another facility we have, and I'm very happy about, um, is we have now our own clean room, which will allow us to fabricate chips at a much higher frequency. Becoming more specific, I want to update you. Where do we stand on the roadmap to build one million qubit, a one million qubit error corrected uh, quantum computer? And I had shown this roadmap uh, the last um, year and wanted to quickly remind you we break down um, getting to the final goal of a million physical qubits before the decade ends, and we broke it down into um, six milestones. So the first one, um, first milestone we consider the achieving of beyond classical computational abilities. We are now ahead of uh, milestone two, which is showing that quantum error correction works in principle. And then we will proceed to a logical qubit, essentially showing that if you distribute the information contained in one logical qubit over a large enough set, about 1,000 uh, data qubits, then 
this information can be kept for a very long uh, time. And then we will take two such logical qubits and connect them via a universal gate set. And at that point, you really have de-risked the quantum physics. The quantum electronics at this stage is encapsulated in a digital module, and you can now uh, start the engineering scale-up and essentially make a machine with almost as many um, qubits as you want. So to tell you where we are now, let's look again at milestone two. The goal is, as I said already, you take the logical information contained in a single qubit and you distribute it over a grid of data qubits. For example, you have a grid of three by three qubits or you go to a grid of five by five qubits. And then what you want to see if you do this is a graph like I have here on the right side. That means um, you have a certain logical error rate, but if you go from a smaller code to a larger code, then the error is suppressed by a factor we call lambda, the suppression factor. And ideally, we would like to have a big lambda, like a factor of 10, but maybe for an initial demonstration, you want to just at least go down by a third or by 50% um, in error rate. And we, where are we in achieving this? So you may have seen that we um, have a paper on uh, repetition code, which is a one-dimensional code. I think all everybody in this audience knows the qubit has two degrees of freedom, so there are two channels for bit flip and phase flip errors. And if you have a one-dimensional code, you have to choose. You can either correct against bit flip or phase flip errors. But we were able then to show what we wanted to see, that as you make the code distance larger, your logical error is exponentially suppressed. And how we got there was by a number of improvements. First, we had to reduce the error of our CZ gates, go to higher fidelity um, CZ gates. Actually, the last numbers is we are at about 0.2% error rate for the uh, CZ gates in parallel, not in isolation. Um, the second piece you need is repetitive readout. This is in difference to um, milestone one, where we only had to read out once at the very end. In error correction, you have to go in every cycle, you have to measure the error syndromes. And finally, we had to add a multi-level reset. And multi-level here means it also takes care of leakage. So if the qubit goes out of the code space and you go to energy level two, then that gets reset as well, and you want to also reset it quickly. So these improvements led uh, to the paper we put on the archive. And then we went on to go to a two-dimensional code, the surface uh, code. And we implemented the following additional set of improvements. So first, I should make a call out to our physics team is that does careful up initio physics-based modeling of various aspects of our hardware. And in that way, we get very good guidance with respect to error budget. Where are the critical points that we have to improve? And if you look at the um, history, short history of quantum error correction, you will notice that often it is assumed that the errors hitting the system are uncorrelated. But of course, every engineer knows that in the real world, that's not the case. There's always correlation. But let's at least try to make it as low as possible. Um, so let's reduce crosstalk, because those physics-based um, models showed that it's a very detrimental effect. Then, of course, you always want longer coherence times. And the last thing, during the given coherence time, you want to do, of course, as much work as possible. So if you reduce the times it takes for readout or reset, then for a given coherence time, you get um, more done. And with this all together, we hope if you would run the experiment today, as this is not experimental data, this is theoretical um, data, I should uh, point out, but we 
would expect that we are about able to do milestone two, reaching a lambda larger than one, and we are just starting these experiments now. And I quickly want to jump all the way to the future, showing this moniker uh, one more time. How do we envision uh, one million physical qubit, which with today's surface code error correction techniques would um, amount to a 1,000 logical uh, qubit machine, how this uh, would look. And here you get a, a sense for this. With this, I want to switch from hardware to software and talk about algorithms. First, about the algorithms for today's processors. As you know, we are in the NISC era, the noisy intermediate scale quantum era before error correction is implemented. And I had also shown this uh, last year, but it's maybe worth repeating. We have internally what we call the gold standard for a NISC publication. So to reach this gold standard, obviously you want to compute a quantity that is commercially or scientifically interesting. Then you want this computation to be beyond the reach of classical machines. And of course, we want to nurture the community overall. So we would encourage ourselves and our collaborators to open source the uh, code for those algorithms so that the next core of uh, scientists and engineers can build on it. So have we reached the gold standard? Not quite, but almost. So let me give you our best example we have so far to do a beyond classical computation for uh, practical uh, tasks. So it's maybe important to uh, realize that, or to note, for practical quantum computing, the focus is really on local operators. In particular, one local operator is the out-of-time order correlator. And what this operator does, it measures how fast information propagates in an entangled quantum system. So the setup is basically I initialize all my qubits, let's say in the x state or in the um, zero state, and then I run a random unitary u, and then I run the inverse, u dagger. And if I had no noise in my system, then I should go back to the initial state, let's say the all zeros. And of course, the correlations between the qubits there would be all one. They're essentially baked uh, together. But to make things more interesting, we will introduce a small perturbance shown here as this butterfly operator, as in butterfly effect as in uh, car chaos theory. So you introduce a small perturbation, and now you want to study how fast is this perturbation propagating through the entangled quantum system. And this is not fully known yet. There are open questions around this, and this is relevant to areas in condensed matter physics, but also to understand what's happening in a black hole behind the event horizon. And what you can see here when you do this experiment, you see essentially the the ripple thing of like throwing a stone into a lake, you want to look how those, how the perturbation, how those ripples are propagating. And then if you look at the data closer, you will see that the signal to noise ratio, so measuring your out of time order correlator, as you make your random circuit bigger and bigger, the signal to noise ratio is coming down. And at a certain size, you're around 240 I swaps, that was the two qubit gate we used. At that level, your signal to noise ratio goes below one. But up to there, you can extract signal. And then, if you look, if I would have simulated this on a large supercomputer, let's say the summit machine, um, here that's what the right graphic does. You notice, oh, 240, where am I? Ah, damn it, I can still do this in just a second on summit. But the good news is, if we would just have improved the fidelity of our two qubit gates by a factor of two, then we would get to around 420 or so I swap 
operations and then you're in a range that would be very costly to do on a supercomputer, on a classical supercomputer. And actually this experiment was done end of um, last year and since then we almost have um, reached this 2x improvement. So we are just at the cusp to do practical computations in a beyond classical regime. I also want to update you a little bit on benchmarking of NISC processes. And since we started it here, I want to do a little review on noisy random circuit sampling. So this was essentially a benchmark um, proposed by Sergio Boixo et al. And the key point that has withstood the test of time is that the classical cost to do random circuit sampling is exponential. And however, there has been improvements and the latest algorithmic techniques, if you would repeat our 2019 experiment, it would not take 10,000 years anymore. Actually, there's a lot of um, smart um, improvements on tensor networks methodology, and you are now down to tens of days to do the classical simulation. But the key point was, again, this exponential separation. So if you would just repeat this experiment also on our latest uh, chip, let's say using uh, 72 qubits, then the time would dramatically shoot up again. So this basic demonstration that you cannot catch up with quantum computers, quantum processes, by classically simulating them, that has withstood the test of time. I also want to quickly address a different technique, noisy boson sampling. And that, because this recently garnered some attention, but it's important to notice that boson sampling can be achieved in polynomial time. In particular, if you look at marginals, or I like to think of it as two point, three point, k point correlators, these correlations are known and they give you information about the probability distribution in question. That's not the case for random circuit sampling. There, the marginals are non-informative. But if you use this information, you can, for example, do the following. Last year, there was a paper from China, uh, a group uh, managed by Zhang Wei Pan, and they claimed beyond classical computational capabilities with boson sampling. But then using these ideas that I just outlined or introducing them, I should say, um, Benjamin Villalonga and Sergio Boixo were able to show, hey, this benchmark task was not really hard. You could, if you look here at the data here, um, the quality of um, the experiment is a dotted line, and we use cross entropy as a distance measure to the ideal distribution. And then you see, oops, you know, the green line is actually below uh, the experimental data. So with a rather cheap order two simulation, you can solve the same uh, benchmark. Wrapping up the section on NISC algorithms, we are obviously looking for collaborators at you, um, the audience here at the uh, summer symposium, and we would like you to work with us. And we therefore have brought up, uh, stood up a uh, quantum computing service. Let's quickly review what it is. So the, our quantum computing, the Google quantum computing service has two pieces. We have uh, simulators in which you can do simulations with up to um, 40 um, qubits. And maybe even more importantly, you have realistic noise models available. That means the simulations are faithful mirrors of what you are later to going to experience on the actual hardware. And then we also have two grids with 50 plus qubit uh, processors in the cloud. And here I should maybe um, do a shout out to the first cohorts who uh, worked with us um, because this was a learning experience, I think, for all of us, in particular for the Google team. And what I have to 
confess I didn't fully appreciate that reaching beyond classical computational capabilities once and writing a nature paper, that's one thing, but having it reliably humming over months at a time and provide proper service levels, as uh, cloud people call this, is a whole different thing. So it took us quite some time to make good on this ambition. We always said, hey, if we want to um, start a quantum computing service, we better have um, computational abilities that you cannot readily replicate on a laptop. And if you want to, please visit our the various links where you can get information on how to get started with our uh, service. And of course, the challenge question we keep asking ourselves during the NISC era all the time, and that we would like to ask you again and again, can you design an algorithm that computes a quantity beyond the reach of classical machines? And if you have an idea there, a proposal there, please reach out to us because then we would like to um, partner with you, support you to perform your experiment on our machines. And of course, at the end, we hope this yields a good publication and we will open source the CERC code. So I want to conclude with an outlook for what are the prospects of real-world impact. My talks I, um, in irregular intervals try to do this because ultimately we have to answer this question. It will cost billions of dollars to build an error-corrected quantum computer. Hey, if you have it, what are you going to do with it? And we are owe it to our investors, whether those are taxpayers or Google shareholders, we owe the world a good answer to that. And I want to give you four areas, energy, production, pharmaceuticals, large-scale machine learning, and computer graphics, things that you may not have heard about yet, where I think there could be, admittedly, these areas are slightly speculative. I'm not saying, yes, there will be commercial, big commercial relevance assured, but these are very worthwhile areas to look at. So let me start with the first one, which addresses the calamity that humankind is facing, and that is global warming. Today, we burn through 20 petawatt hours of energy, and this will triple over the next decades due to population growth and increased industrialization. And now, something I only realized in in hindsight, it will not be good enough to just replace those 60 petawatt hours by carbon-free energy. Many base industrial processes, such as making cement, um, making steel, are carbon-intensive processes. And if you want to decarbonize those, you have a second factor of two. So you are now with 120 petawatt hours of energy that we will need for a carbon-free industry. And as desirable as renewable energies are, and as much as we should strive to build them out, they will probably not be enough. Nuclear fission, which is carbon-free too, has a problem that the management of radioactive waste is just too expensive. So it would be a most welcome tool in our chest if you could make nuclear fusion work. And one type of nuclear fusion that I find particularly elegant is inertial confinement fusion. Maybe that's because I like laser parties. What you do here is you have a nanostructured reactor that contains the fuel, uh, for example, PB11 um, boron hydride, and then you hit it with a really strong laser, petawatt laser. And then all sorts of extreme physics regimes happen. For example, you blast out in the inner um, tubes all the electrons, and they will flow back on the periphery, so you get the cylindrical current. And for a short time, this whole thing happens in a femtosecond range, you have magnetic fields that are even stronger than in magnetic confinement fusion. And now the positive nuclei are just sitting there naked, and this will lead to a Coulomb uh, explosion. Now, if you talk to a numerical plasma physicist who model such systems, they will tell you or 
One way to do it is to use a technique that is known as the BBKYG hierarchy, where essentially you get a list of Schrodinger equations, a one particle, two particle, k particle um, equation, and then you truncate this hierarchy. So here is the shown is the two particle Schrodinger equation, and you can interpret these particles as the proton and the boron nucleus. And they move in certain electromagnetic fields. So what was interesting to me, typically as quantum computing people, if you look for a quantum advantage, we go to places where we have entanglement between many um, particles, let's say, many fermions. But the people doing the numerics here will tell you, hey, this is already an expensive problem because the nuclei are small, so you need about a thousand grid points for the numerics in one spatial dimension. There are six spatial dimensions, so you are left with 10 to the 18 grid points. And then you go times time. So this is very expensive, and this is something probably worth looking at for our community, because nothing, I think, would be more marvelous if we, it would turn out that quantum computing delivers the essential design insights to build nuclear fusion reactors better. The next era, area I want to point out to is the precision design of pharma cores. And the reason I have a hunch quantum computing may play a role here is the basic empirical fact that if you take two substances and you rip out nuclear from one substance and you replace it by an isotope, for example, you take out a hydrogen atom and you put a deuterium in, then there are differences in smell, taste, or psychoactivity between those isotopologues. Yeah, for example, there are perfumes. If you do what I just said, you replace the hydrogen atoms by deuterium, they suddenly smell completely different. Or heavy water tastes sweeter than normal water. Or the psychoactive effect of lithium-6 is very different from lithium-7. By the way, a little fun fact I learned when preparing this presentation. 7-Up was is actually, in the original recipe, they had lithium citrate in there, and it was lithium-7, which happens to act as a mood stabilizer. So how can we understand these differences? Because it's not, it's a bit surprising, you know, to a biochemist would say, hey, the electronic clouds, which matter for my reaction, that they're all the same between the isotopologues. Pharmacologists would say the same thing. But there was a conjecture originally formulated by Luca Turin when studying scent that receptors, neuroreceptors, perform inelastic tunneling spectroscopy. So essentially, you have some electronic transitions that start a neural signaling chain, and they are aided by resonances in the vibrational spectrum of the molecules. And we actually tried this idea for the serotonin receptor, and we used serotonin-like um, molecules, and we, with up initio quantum chemistry simulations, we replaced hydrogen by deuterium. And then, to our delight, we could give excellent retrodictions of the efficacy of known pharma lines. Then, unfortunately, we did um, an experiment with human um, pyramidal brain cells in a Petri dish, but we could not um, confirm those uh, predictions. But this was only a single experiment, and the basic empirical evidence is still there. So, of course, here again, it would be marvelous if you could understand where the differences between isotopologues come from, and can this be used to make agents, agonists for certain receptors act just at the strengths we want, and to reduce side effects of certain medicaments, let's lower um, the potency for receptors we do not want to activate. Okay, let's go to a, a third area. 
which is machine learning. And this is a recent result um, from an intern, um, Alex Sokapa, working with uh, Seth Lloyd. And they're building on a number of papers, including a Google paper, that showed that if you look at neural networks that have very wide layers, so in the limit case of infinitely wide layers, the learning dynamic under gradient descent can be described by linear models. And then, of course, as quantum computing people, we immediately think, oh, we know we can have exponential speed ups when doing linear algebra. And then there is a very nice self-consistency phenomenon which says that the neural tangent kernel involved here is well conditioned. And that leads to the matrix um, that uh, you want involved in the linear algebra is well conditioned as well, um, which is a precondition for uh, this uh, to give you for this to work and to give you a good speed up. So, yes, if probably you were thinking of this already. We will need a quantum RAM where we would store the photos, or we would store the um, language strings, and this, of course takes linear effort um, to build up those memories. But once you have them, then you can amortize this effort over many training runs. And it's well known that training very large neural networks is enormously expensive. So you press the enter button, and I haven't checked recently, but it's easily in the millions of dollars um, a large training run costs. And of course, it would get the attention of my boss Jeff Dean, if I could tell him, hey, you know, you can do it at $30 and much cheaper. So here, another opportunity, quantum computing to train very large neural networks. And I want to end um, on a fun application. I'm a father, I have uh, two boys, and maybe many parents um, made that experience as well or can commiserate with me. They like to play computer games much more than I would like to see. So they get sucked into the virtual worlds and I have a feeling we as parents have little way to stop this. And I feel, okay, if that's where humankind is going, then let's make at least sure that what, at least me personally, what I enjoy, if you go into nature and you see these intricate, beautiful patterns, then I mean, we can get philosophical about it, but the patterns of nature are a result of quantum interference. And virtual worlds today don't have this, so they're lacking the spark of God, so to speak. Um, but with quantum techniques, for example, quantum GANs, we have an opportunity to bring this interference um, back. You may recall that GANs, quantum adversarial, sorry, generative adversarial networks, are essentially a game between two networks where you have a generator network that makes a picture like this flower, and then you have a discriminator network whose task is it to say this picture was a photo from the real world, or hey, you discriminator, uh, sorry, you generator uh, made this uh, picture. And of course, the, uh, generator wants to make um, more than one image. And to do this, it takes a noise vector that comes from some distribution. And this distribution, if you would use a quantum distribution, would, which is not representable by classical means, this or the fact that we can have probability distributions from which we feed the generator means that, in principle, we have the opportunity to outperform uh, classical GANs. And we have indeed seen in our successes, but they have been for quantum data. But we have been working with an art studio um, of Rafik Anadol, and we, he will actually talk a little bit later this morning. And actually, this picture I took in his studio. And they have essentially implemented this. And they tell us the artists like quantum noise, and they prefer it over the noise generators that come with uh, 
packages uh, or typical graphics uh, packages. So here may be an opportunity for the first consumer application. And with that, I would like uh, to summarize. So I hope I was able to convince you that our community is striving. And the question you should ask yourself, can you see yourself being part of it? And the other update was, hey, we are making steady progress towards an error-corrected um, quantum computer. And would you be interested in being part of our team? And last, NISC algorithms are an exciting research area. And there are solid prospects for real-world impact and return on investment. And we often say we are just one creative algorithm away from that. And yeah, do you have such an algorithm to propose? And with this, I would like to hand it over to Emmy, who will delight us with a poem.